this next speaker, I've had the pleasure of introducing over and over again, uh, but well, I, I, anyway, uh, Greta Christina has been writing professionally since 1989, but she has been a badass since birth. She writes on her blog, Greta Christina's blog, At The Orbit. She's on Twitter, she's on Facebook, she's written tons of books, and if you're not reading or following Greta's work, you're wrong. <laughs> Please welcome to the stage, Greta Christina. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, hi, I'm really, really glad to be here. Thank you to Skepticon and Lauren and all the Skepticon volunteers, and thanks to everybody for being here today. Um, I had this talk prepared. I had a talk prepared. Um, I was going to have this talk about practicing atheism in everyday life, and it was going to be full of inspiration and, and hope and talking about meaning and pleasure and, you know, morality and building community. Um, and Tuesday night happened. And I, it became wildly inappropriate. Uh, so, I'm doing something today that I don't do. I, I always super prepare my talks, I over prepare them. I kind of am not 100% sure what I'm going to say. Um, I took some notes, I have some notes, that's why I have my phone in my hand. I took some notes on the plane ride here. Um, but I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to say. Um, um, I don't promise not to cry. If I cry, please, Skepticon people, don't like come up and get me. If I'm, I'm crying, I still want to be here and I will move on. Um, uh, so um, some content notes. Um, I'm going to be talking about racism pretty extensively in some pretty extreme terms. Sexism, misogyny, sexual assault, not e extensively, but I will be talking about it. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the, the lack of bodily autonomy, uh, and I am going to be talking about despair. I am, the topic of my talk today is the world we're in now. Uh, I'm talking about the world we are in under the Trump administration. Um, so I, uh, the, my friend and colleague Nikki Massey died in October and I wrote an obituary for her and one of the things I said about her was that among the many, many amazing things about her that she was one of the most compassionate people I knew and her compassion did not take the form of bringing you tea and, and holding your hand and, and reassuring you that everything was going to be okay. Uh, Nikki's compassion took the form of flying into a rage at the people who had hurt you and reassuring you that you are not imagining things. Things were not okay. Um, that is the comfort <laughs> that I'm offering you today. I hope that it is real comfort. Uh, you are not imagining things. Things are not okay. Um, I, I write a lot and I think a lot about grief. Um, and one of the things I've noticed about grief in myself and in some other people is that when I'm grieving, um, the fact that the world goes on is, is kind of upsetting. You know, I don't know if other people have this. It's like, my person is gone. How can you all just be going to the grocery store and, and having coffee dates and you know, hooking up on okay, Cupid. how can you do that? How can you just, how can the world continue when my life is just, is devastated? You know, it, it's baffling, it's, it's surreal, it feels insulting. Um, I had not realized until Tuesday night and Wednesday morning that even though all that is true, the fact that the world continues when we're grieving is also a great comfort. You know, I can, when I'm grieving, I can sink into despair, I can scream, I can cry, I can wrap blankets around me and binge watch Parks and Recreation for 10 hours, I can shut down. And when I'm ready to come back, the world is there. When I'm ready to sort of take my little feet, to take a few steps into the world, uh, the world is there. Um, and this grief is different. Um, what I am grieving and what many of us are grieving is the loss of our world.
What we are grieving is the fact that our world is gone and we do not have it to come back to. You know, we, many of us are crying, screaming, numbing out, freaking out, in deep despair, in deep uncertainty. And when we're ready to come out from that, our world is not going to be there. Our world is gone. And that is what we are grieving. Our, our, the, one, the world that we had on November 7th is no longer there. And I don't think we're going to get it back. Not anytime soon, and, and I don't know if we're going to get it back. A and to a great extent, something we really need to face, something we need to accept, it's that, that, that world was, part of that world was never there. A significant amount of that world was an illusion. Um, and, I, and I think we need to face that. Uh, I think, for instance, uh, many white people were under the illusion that black people's bodies belonged to them. And of course, black people's bodies belong to them in the, in the larger sense, in the sense of that's how the world should be in this sort of large justice sense. But I think many of us are waking up to the reality that in a very real way, black people's bodies and brown people's bodies in this country belong to the state. And the state can put them behind bars, the state can beat them, the state can shoot them, the state can rape them, and it's almost certain that nothing will happen. There will be no consequences. And we're waking up from that illusion that that was not true. Uh, a lot of men were under the illusion that women owned our own bodies, that women could decide for ourselves who to have sex with, who to touch, who to have touch us, um, who to photograph us, um, that we could decide for ourselves whether we wanted to donate one, our organs for nine months. <laughs> you know, we could die, decide for ourselves, is that a good idea? People, women and people with uteruses, I should say, could decide for ourselves. Um, do we want to donate our organs for nine months or do we not want to do that? And many men are now waking up to the fact that that is not true. And it should be true in the larger justice sense, it is true. But in a very real sense, women's bodies in this country are owned by men. Men can do with them what they like. Men can grab them. Men can grope them. Uh, men can disrobe them. Men can corner them. Men can photograph them. Men can rape them. And it's very likely that nothing will happen. Um, um, Cisgender people, many cisgender people were under the illusion that trans people's bodies and non-binary people's bodies belong to them. And again, in this larger sense, in this way, in this sort of big justice sense, in this deeper truth sense, of course that is true. But there is this reality in this country that gender is policed. Gender is policed very heavily. And it's policed for everybody, but it is especially heavily policed, is, by, is brutally policed for trans people and non-binary people. It is, at best, it is policed with shame and ostracization. Um, at worst, it is policed with the job loss, home loss, and violence and death. And that is particularly true for trans women of color. Straight people, heterosexual people, were under the illusion that lesbian bodies, gay bodies, bisexual bodies, pansexual bodies, bodies of people who are not heterosexual, belonged to us. Asexual bodies, I'm gonna add asexual bodies to that because that's an important part of this picture. Um, you know, they were under the illusion that we could choose who to share our bodies with, who not to do that, whether to do it, when to do it, with whom. Um, and a lot of people are waking up to the reality that that is not the world we live in. People, most people, many people in this country do not own our own bodies. Um, and we were under a lot of illusions. And you know, people told us, you know, black people have been saying, black people have been screaming that we live in white supremacy. Women have been saying, women have been screaming that we live in rape culture. Um, it's been a very hard message.
message to get across, and I think it's still going to be a hard message. I think there's still a lot of people who do not want to hear this, but you here, now we know. We know that. And I feel like a little bit of a jerk for saying that, because you, know you know that and you can't unknow it, and there are consequences to that. Um, you know, this country elected a president who gleefully boasted of sexually assaulting women. Uh, this country elected a president who was endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and now we know that. So that's part of the world that we lost. Part of the world we lost was these illusions. But it wasn't all illusion. I don't think all of what we lost was illusion. Um, we lost some things that were not illusion. Um, we lost a lot of work. We lost so much work. You know, so many of us have been working to, to make a difference. You know, we've been working, to, we've been doing harm reduction and we've been doing it somewhat successfully. You know, we haven't been building the shining city on the hill, fuck that. Um, but we've been, there's all these people in the world who are, they're living in holes, we're living in holes and we're trying to scratch our way out of the holes or we're trying to just live in the hole and have a life there. And many of us have been doing successful work, kind of filling in that hole a little bit, making it easier to live in, filling it in so it's not as easy to, not as hard to get out of, building ladders, building stairs, you know, just throwing a rope down, you know, or throwing, you know, building, and it's not just we're not doing it for them, people in the holes, people in the trenches have been working to make it easier for themselves, for ourselves, and for one another to, to live there and to, and to climb out. We have been doing successful work. Um, it was not an illusion that if things had gone differently and not that differently on Tuesday, November 8th, we, we could have gone on with that. We could have gone on scratching out these little differences, making things a little better, making things a little easier, making things a little more level, Building, I don't know, building something. You, this was not all an illusion. Some of it was, and you know, humanists especially, I am a humanist, and I, and I love humanists, and humanists can be very idealistic about the world we really live in, and, and some of that has, was an illusion, but some of it was not. We did a lot of work, and it has been undone. Um, and we lost a lot of hope. There were things that we hoped for. There were things that we, that we hoped we could build, that you know, maybe we could fill in these trenches so we could build something. We, we, you know, we had ideas of the world that we wanted, and some of those ideas were pipe dreams, and some of them weren't. And some of them were pipe dreams, but you know, we could take a few little steps toward it, you know, make it a little closer, to the world that we wanted, we had hope for the world that we wanted to make and, and were making. And a lot of that hope is gone. That is the world that we lost on Tuesday, November 8th. We lost a world that was made up of partly of illusion, partly of work, and partly of hope. And when we come out of our grief, when we're ready to take our steps into the new world, to the new world that we have now, that world that we're going to be returning to, it is not the same world. It, the world we're going to be coming to is a world of survival, a world of taking care of each other, and a world of resistance. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, I'm not actually an expert in resistance movements. I'm going to have to become one. You know, um, I'm not an expert in resistance movements. I don't, I don't know what that looks like. And I don't know what this world looks like. I think what a lot of, what's happening for me and I think what's happening for a lot of people is it's like, it's like in a science fiction movie. You got knocked on the floor, you got flattened, you were unconscious, and you wake up and you're somewhere else. You're in this other planet. You're in an alternate reality. Um, and we don't know what the world looks like. It's, we don't, we're trying to figure it out. Um, 
I think the best case scenario is that we have been set back by decades. I think the best case scenario is that we're going to have a lot of, we're going to lose a lot of the work we did on LGBT rights, that we're going to lose a lot of um, reproductive rights, uh, that things for, that there's going to be an, a significant uptick in black and brown, violence against black and brown people. There's already been that. There's going to be a significant uptick in hate crimes uh, against trans people, against LGBT people. The, 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 you know, the, the best case scenario, honestly, that I have. Um, there is a little hope at the end of this, sort of, I promise. Um, the base case scenario is that we lose a huge amount of work and face a world that is more violent and more hateful. Um, the worst case scenario, um, okay, so a lot of us this weekend and a lot of us in the last few days, and honestly a lot of us in the lead up to the election, have been talking about Nazi Germany. You know, we've been talking about, in our case, in 2016, 2017, moving forward, uh, we've been talking about Muslims being identified and put on a registry and having their neighborhoods walled off. Um, our president-elect said that he was going to do that. He said he was going to do that. And we can't say that that's not possible. We know that that is possible. It has happened. We know that that is possible. Um, we, you know, we could be looking at a complete and utter ignoring and setting aside of the Constitution and, and the law by the people who are sworn to uphold it. Um, we, we could be looking at um, open season on black and brown people. I mean, more than we already do. We already have open season on black and brown people, but I mean really open season. Open season that doesn't try to pretend that it's not what it is. Open season that doesn't give half-assed excuses about how, you know, he was selling loose cigarettes so he deserved to die. Open season that just kills. Um, here's the thing, that's not the worst case scenario. That's a really bad fucking scenario, and it's possible, and I do not want anybody in this room to think that that is not possible. We know it's possible. It's not the worst case scenario. The worst case scenarios are global war, Nuclear war, the really worst case scenario, the one that I can't actually talk about very much because my brain kind of goes numb when I talk about, is global warming goes unchecked and game over. Civilization ends. Um, those, these are real possibilities. Um, and I don't know, we don't know what world we're in yet. We don't know which of these scenarios we're in. You know, we're all kind of, they, you know, we all got bonked on the head and we're standing up and we're in this other, on this, in this other world. We don't know what it is. Um, so it, this may be a little arrogant of me, um, but I also think it's true and this is a skeptic conference and at this time of all times, I, I want to just be up here and say what I think is true. Um, um, so if it's arrogant, I apologize. I know that there are a lot of people in these communities who, who look to me, uh, who look to me for guidance, uh, who look to me for inspiration, um, who look to me for ideas about how to live a life, look to me for some sort of vision. And, and, and people don't look to me to follow me, to follow in my path. I hope you don't anyway, because I don't want you to do that. I, what I hope, what I want, and what I think people are doing is look to me for ideas about how to find their own path. Um, I wrote this book, it just came out this year, it's called The Way of the Heathen, and there's this happy cartoon drawing of me confidently going ahead, and there's a path, and there's different paths, because you can take different paths. Um, I got nothing. That's actually not quite true. I said I was gonna tell the truth, that's not quite true. I have very little. I know people are looking for what I have to offer 
and in this time, I have very little right now to offer. I'm listening a lot um, in the last few days because um, I don't know. Um, you know, I don't have a path because I'm just barely standing up. I am barely finding my balance. You know, I've been flattened and I've been climbing my way to my feet and I'm just, hang on. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, I'm just, I'm trying to put one foot in front of the other every day. I'm trying to say, okay, I don't know what I need to do, but what I need to do is get out of bed and, and get some breakfast and, and return my messages. That's what I, I need to just put one foot in front of the other. I'm trying to do that. I don't, I don't have a path into this new world. Um, and I will be honest, um, I'm having a very hard time wanting to find a path into this new world. I'm having a very hard time wanting to be in this world. You know, I'm hanging on and there's, I will be okay for some value of okay. People keep asking me, how are you doing? And I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know how I'm doing. Um, you know, I'm having a hard time wanting to live in this world and I'm having a very hard time knowing how to do it and where to go. Um, there are a few things that I'm hanging on to that are helping me keep my balance, that are helping me stay on my feet. Um, I don't know if they will help you. I mean, that's always true. I always say, you take what you need and leave the rest. And I, I really, take what you need and leave the rest. I don't know if those, this will help you. It's helping me. A few people I'm talking to, talking with say, it's helped this kind of, I'm, a lot of these ideas are coming from you. A lot of these ideas are coming from the community. We're all kind of trying to find a way. Um, here are a few things that are helping me just hang on. Um, number one, take care of ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves. I, I, I give a talk on activism burnout. It's not unlike Bria's talk, although it's more before the fact than after. Um, and I, in this talk, I have this big, I printed up this big banner with the, because I don't like to use PowerPoint. I printed up this big banner that says self-care is not selfish. Self-care is not selfish. Now more than ever. What is it they say on the, on the airplanes? Uh, put your own oxygen mask on before you help others. Um, and self-care takes a lot of different forms and it's really different for different people. That's always been true, it's even more true now. You know, for some people, self-care is taking a walk and getting some exercise and getting outside. And for some people, self-care is eating six chocolate sundaes. You know, for, for some people, self-care is, I can't look at social media, I can't look at the news. And for some people, it's diving into it. Diving, trying to explore the new world and figure out what the fuck it is. And, and connecting with other people. Um, for some people, um, self-care is trying to, to, like, to heal some wounds, to, to heal some old, to, to, to build some, rebuild some old bridges that were burned, uh, to, to reach out, to try to um, communicate, to try to teach, to try to connect. Um, uh, for some people, self-care is cutting people off who they think, feel, know to be unsafe. You know, and that's, I've seen people talk about cutting off friends, cutting off family, cutting off partners and spouses. That's self-care for some people. We are all gonna do this really differently and I want us to respect that. I want us to acknowledge that, that what we need to do for us to just stand up, to just stand up and take those first little steps um, is not what somebody else needs to do. And unless you're like really doing serious harm to somebody, um, you, you, get to, you get to decide. Um, there's one little exception to that, but I'm gonna get to that. No, actually, I'm just gonna say it. Um, 
one of the things that many people have been doing to do self-care is the sort of denial to shut it out. To just, I can't look at it, I can't see this. And also kind of to deny, it's not, it can't be that bad, it's not that bad, it can't be that bad. Um, that is okay for now. If that's true now, you should probably leave this talk because this is not a good place to do that uh, self-care. That is okay for now. There is going to come a point where I'm going to grab you by the shoulders and say, you know, you need to look at this because you need to help. You need to take action. Um, there's going to be a time where I'm going to say, you don't want to be the person who looked away from this. But that's not true right now, and if you need to, right now to look away, uh, you can. Um, so, yeah, we need to take care of ourselves, and something else I'm hanging on to really, really tight is taking care of each other. You know, taking care of each other. I, I said before that um, I was having a hard time wanting to live in this new world. And that's true. Um, one of the things that is making me want to live in this new world is that all y'all are in it. And I wanna be in this with you. And I wanna help you if I can. Um, That's one of the things that's, and I've talked with other people for whom the same thing is true. This is really common. I don't want to be here, but other people are depending on me. I'm seeing these other faces in distress, these other bodies in distress, um, and, and I want to I want to help, or I just want to witness. I just want to be there with them. Sometimes that's the only fucking help we can give, is to just witness and be there, and like, like Nikki said, reassure them. It is reassuring to hear somebody say, you're right, this is not okay. Um, taking care of other people also takes lots of different forms, and we do it in different ways. Just like we need different kinds of care, we, we give each other different kinds of care. You know, for, for some people it's, you know, spreading the word about things that are terrible so that the people that the terrible things are done to are, are, are not ignored. Um, uh, for some people it's, you know, making food, um, you know, just really practical, you know, hands-on, you know, do you need, you know, making food, do it running errands, um, uh, for some people, it's um, trying to offer hope. For some people, it's trying to offer hope. Trying to say, trying to offer the, say, we can fight. You know, we can, um, we can, we can, make, we can make a plan. We have this in us. We can do this. Um, we all take care of each other in different ways. And something I'm noticing a lot in the last few days is sometimes those clash. What the people giving care want is not always what the people getting the care need. And, you know, I know that some of us really want, like immediately, like the, within an hour of knowing about this devastating news, um, we're optimistic, planning, strategizing. Um, some people really needed that and still need that. Uh, some people need to just be numb. Some people need to not be doing that. Some people just need to numb the fuck out. Um, and some people, um, this is me, some people, I think I'm not the only one, some people just need to stare in the abyss. We just need to look at it. We need to look at the abyss. We need to sit with the despair. You know, we need to we need to look, just look, look at this world and look at how we feel about it and try to get a sense of the, the shape of it. Um, 
So it's just something when we take care of each other, let's make sure, you know, you know, it's, I wrote a post on Facebook and I said, content note, hope. Because that's hard for some people, it's actually hard for me right now. I, I have a hard time right now hearing it's going to be okay, we'll get through this without feeling like I'm being gaslighted. <laughs> um, and I know that's not people's intention. Um, so let's take care of each other and let's make sure that the care we offer is, is wanted and needed. And something that's really helping me is letting myself be taken care of. Let's let ourselves be taken care of. You know, I said before that you know, we get to have boundaries about that. We absolutely have to get to have boundaries about that. I just said that. If the care that's being offered is, is not needed or is, is painful or upsetting, we get to have boundaries about that. But I don't want us to think that because we're all devastated, because we're all flattened, that, we, that it is selfish to, to let ourselves be cared for, that it's a burden. I am not the only one for whom the thing that's getting me out of bed every morning is other people need me. So when we let ourselves be cared for, we're giving that to other people. Um, and this is sort of related to that, um, and I'm, it's gonna get a little harsh here but it's important. One of the most important things that we need to do in this new world is listen. We need to listen. We need to do the kind of listening that means shutting the fuck up and stopping talking. And that really listening, not just listening, and in particular we need to listen to the people who are gonna be most damaged in this new world, to the people who are most in danger in this new world. We need to listen when they say what the, world, what the world is for them. We need to listen when they say what they need from us and want from us, when they say what they don't need from us and want from us, when they tell us that what we're doing is hurting them, when they tell us this is really what I need over here. Um, we need to listen. Um, and when people are telling you about their world and it's worse than yours, it's scarier than yours, it's more dangerous than yours, um, don't, don't minimize it, don't trivialize it, don't say that it's gonna be okay to people who know that it is fucking well not gonna be okay. Um, When you, when you do, uh, here's the thing, and I know, you're I know people are trying to be comforting. I know people are trying to be comforting when they say it's going to be okay, it's not that bad, it's just an election, we'll get through the next four years, we'll elect somebody else, it'll be okay. Um, when, when you say that to the people who are most in danger in this new world, it, it's not comforting. What they, what, what they hear, what we hear, is because is, there's ways in which I'm more in danger and ways in which I'm less. So wait, what they hear and what we hear is either that you're not listening or that you don't really think this is that bad. That you don't really think white supremacy is that bad. That you don't really think rape culture is that bad. That you don't really think fascism is that bad. Um, When the people who are in most danger are talking about this, are talking about the new world we're in, do not make the conversation about you. Um, and I'm gonna get really real here. This, is, this may be hard for some people to hear, but I'm just gonna say this. Um, when, when you go into a conversation where people are talking about the danger they're in, the danger their, their lives are in, their bodies are in, the danger their children are in, the danger their grandchildren are in, the real physical danger. People are going to die in this new world. I mean, people die in every world, obviously, but a lot of people are gonna die. There's gonna be deaths because of this new world. People are gonna be, there's gonna be an increase in hate crimes. There's 
probably going to be an increase in suicide. Um, there's going to be people who die because they don't get health care. Pe people are going to die in this world. Um, and when you go into a conversation where people are talking about that, and you start saying, but I have hurt feelings because not all white people and not all men. Um, when you do that, you're, you're saying that your hurt feelings matter more than their bodies and their lives. And there is a word for that, and that word is white supremacy. White supremacy isn't just the KKK. I mean, it is the KKK, and boy, now it's really fucking well the KKK, because the KKK endorsed the President of the United States. Um, and we often talk about, oh, well, you know, it's like, you know, racism doesn't always look like the KKK, and now we're really okay, but the KKK is like really, they're not this fringe weirdo group small fringe weirdo group, they're mainstream. They were, I don't know if you know this, but KKK was mainstream in America for a long time. They were respected, politicians sought their endorsements. Um, so don't, let's not think that that's not the world. So that is also white supremacy. White supremacy is also white people saying that we matter more. White people saying that our hurt feelings are more important than your bodies and your lives, the real danger that you are in. Um, and on the subject of hurt, hurt feelings, because I know there's gonna be a lot of hurt feelings, there's gonna be a lot of hurt feelings. This is gonna be hard, we are all raw, none of us knows where to go. I've, I, one of the things I keep saying is that all of my calibrations are off. You know, all of my instincts are off. My instincts, my calibrations for how safe am I in this bar where the guy is trying to horn in on the conversation? How safe am I? Um, who can I trust? Um, should, I, should I fight? Should I flee? Should I retreat? Um, should I, you know, all of my calibrations are off. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of hurt feelings. Um, Please don't get upset if the people who are most endangered in this new world don't automatically trust you. Don't, don't get hurt feelings. White people don't get hurt feelings if black and brown people don't automatically trust you. Men don't get hurt feelings if women don't automatically trust you. You know, they don't know what's in your head. It's like, I know you're thinking, I'm trustworthy, I can be trusted, I can be relied on. They don't know that, you know, it's like a, a a black person meets you, they don't know whether you're the person who, you know, yes, fucking will, well, will drive them 12 hours if they're in, you know, to another state if they're in danger, or if you're the person who's gonna roll your eyes and say all lives matter, or if you're the person who painted a swastika and racial slurs and hates on their school. They don't know who you are. You know, Men, women don't know who you are. We don't know what's in your head. We don't know if you're the guy who's really gonna have our back, you know, who's really gonna, you know, tell all his friends that they're being assholes, who's really gonna stand up when he sees women being threatened. We don't know if you're that guy or if you're the guy who's gonna roll your eyes at rape culture. We don't know if you're the guy who's gonna grope us, who's gonna grab us, who's gonna rape us. We don't know. And do not come at me with any false equivalency about, oh, that's generalization and that's racism, that's reverse racism, that's reverse sexism. Do not come at me with that because it's not the same. The power is different. White people are the ones with the power. Men are the ones with the power. White people and men are the ones who actually have the power to do damage. We're, white people are the ones who, I get it. I get why you don't trust us. Men, I hope you get why we don't tr trust you automatically. Um, so don't make that about you. It's not personal. And you know what? If you, if you do make it personal, if you do, like, do this, you know, the false equivalency and, you know, I know you can't trust the world now, but my hurt feelings, so let's talk about that for two hours, you're proving that they're right. You're proving that they can't be trusted.
that you're proving that you cannot be trusted. You're proving that you can't be trusted, and they're right. Um, so don't do that. Um, we need to be willing to be uncomfortable. And this is, Alex Jules gave a talk once on diversity, you know, one of the many talks that, you know how black speakers in our community pretty much always get to, invited to speak about diversity and being black and don't get invited to speak about much else um, most of the time. So Alex Jules was giving this really great talk on how to make your community more diverse, um, how to make your community more welcoming, more supportive, more inclusive of more people, how to offer what more people need. Um, and one of the things that he said was you, you need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, that is more true than ever now. We need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, and that's, there's a way in which that's harsh. It, it's me, for, for me, it's really comforting because I am uncomfortable. I can barely stand to be in my skin now. I want to, where, whatever I'm doing, I want to be, do, be doing something else, except honestly, right now, this is good. Um, I'm, I, I'm, my body is uncomfortable. I, I, it's hard for me to eat. Um, it's hard for me to sleep. I'm grinding my teeth. I am really uncomfortable. Um, and I think a lot of us are really uncomfortable. And it's reassuring to me to know that is the, that's an appropriate reaction. That is an appropriate response. So we need to be willing in the new world to do things that we are not comfortable with. We need to step out of our, we're gonna to need to step out of our comfort zone. This is a different world and we're gonna to need to do things that we don't know how to do. We're gonna to need to learn how to do things that we're not good at. Um, we're gonna to need to, you know, again, learn to listen when people tell us we're fucking up because the stakes are really high now. We need to be willing to be uncomfortable. Um, and if we have privilege, and I, privilege is such a loaded word, people don't want to hear it, and they say, well, use a different word, but you know, any word we use for that is gonna be loaded, because it's not the word that's loaded, it's the concept that's loaded. Um, privilege doesn't mean everything is going your way. Privilege doesn't mean you're super rich, super healthy, everything's great. Um, you know, privilege means that we have advantages that we haven't earned. And that's a shorthand and it's obviously a big topic, but privilege means we have advantages that we haven't earned. You know, and even if you're really broke and you're struggling to find a job and you're a white guy, you still have privilege because it's easier for you than it is for the black woman who's also struggling trying to find a job and her resume is 50% less likely to be looked at than yours. Um, so those of us who have privilege, um, and I count myself as one of those, you know, I am in some ways, I'm on the now really in danger end of the stick. I'm, you know, I'm a woman, I'm queer, uh, I'm mentally ill. Um, in some ways, I'm on the very privileged end of that stick. I'm white, I'm comfortably middle class, financially secure, homeowner. Um, relatively healthy other than my brain. Um, I, you know, I used to say, when I talked about privilege, I used to say I live in the United States and that's a privilege. I don't think that's true anymore, but um, if, if we have privilege, let's look at the ways that we can leverage it. Let's look at what we can do with it. You know, if we have money, let's think about what are some ways that we can use that money? This is something Ingrid and I have been talking about, it's like, maybe we need to scale back a little. I mean, we're not rich, we're just comfortably middle class, but, um, you know, we you know, spend some money on some luxuries. I'm kind of looking at, maybe there's some things we need to scale back on, because we're gonna need to help people. There are gonna be some people who are in really dire need, and we're gonna need to help them. Um, if you have a home that you can share, you know, think about, is there a way that you can share it? You know, short term, long term, um, if we have expertise in something, expertise in, in law, in, in computer security, you know, if we have expertise in something, let's think about how we can share that to people who, who are going to need it, to the people who are more in danger than we are. If we have a strong body, let's think about ways that we could share that strong body and use that. Um, 
You know, if our mere presence makes things safer for women, for black and brown people, for queer people, let's, let's use that. And again, don't, you know, offer help, offer help and take no for an answer, but um, if we have a media platform, you know, let's look at ways we can share it. And if, if we can just, if we just have enough privilege and enough safety to speak, if it's safe for us to speak, let's look at speaking, even if it's uncomfortable. Um, so a, lo a lot of people, and I am one of these people, a lot of people, you know how we have fantasies about what we would have done if we had been in Nazi Germany? And sometimes it's fantasies, sometimes it's just conversations. What do you, what do you think you would have done? And sometimes it's fantasies, you know, it's like, I would have been, in, I totally would have been in the resistance, you know, I would have, I would have sheltered the Jews, you know, I would have fought 17 Nazi tigers with my bare hands, you know. Um, we are about to be tested. Those of us who have had fantasies about what it was like to live under a fascist authoritarian regime are about to be tested, because that's what we're looking at. Um, And so I want us to think about, and not, it doesn't have to be now, we don't have to make a plan now, this is really important. If planning helps you, then plan. We don't have to make a plan right now. I can't plan more than maybe a, a month ahead. You know, the, the, the biggest plan that I have so far for this new world, is, other than get out of bed every morning, um, is I am co-organizer of this community in San Francisco called the Godless Perverts, and we, um, sort of focus of social support and performance events focused on um, non-religious views of sexuality. And I was just talking with my co-organizer, Chris Hall, and I said, you know, our next, let's make our next meetup be about participating in a resistance movement. That's about as far, that's the, the farthest plan ahead that I have. Um, So we don't have to make the plan now, but when we're ready, let's think about what we can do to step up. And if it helps you to think of it this way, you know, in 50 years, in 75 years, in 100 years, assuming there is still a civilization at that time, um, people are gonna be writing about this. People are gonna be writing about this time in history. And think about who you want to be, who you wanna be in this history. Do you want to be the people who stood by? Do you want to be the people who, who closed your eyes? Who just kind of got on with, went on with business as usual, even as the business was radically changing? Do you want to the be the people who after, in the aftermath, defended themselves by saying, we didn't know? We didn't know how bad it was. Remember earlier I said that I was kind of being an, an asshole for telling you all this. That, this is why I'm being an asshole. You don't get to be that person now. You do not get to be. You, you, that excuse is gone for you. You know. You don't get to say after this is all over, if it's over, that you didn't know. Um, so do you want to be that person or do you want to be the people who resisted in whatever way we could? Do you want to be the people who provided shelter? Do you want to be the people who fought in the resistance? Or the people who supported the people who fought in the resistance, who fed them, who drove them, who, you know, took care of them medically, who, who just took care of them? Do you want to be the people who fled? And you know what, if you flee, I support you. I am not going to tell you don't flee. You know, I don't look at the people who fled Nazi Germany in 1933 and 1934 and go, they were cowards. I'm kind of looking at, I'm looking at that option myself. I'm going, oh, they were pretty smart. And not that the people who stayed were not smart. That is, that's a legitimate option, fleeing. So if you do flee, if you do get the hell out of Dodge, um, are you gonna be the people who flee and then you make a space there for the other people who are fleeing? You try to get other people there. You, put, you shelter people and help them find their feet. 
You spread the word, you spread the news in the place that you fled to. Um, you know, you, you, you amplify the voices of the people who are, are most in danger. Um, and here's the thing, a lot of, a lot of people have sort of heroic fantasies. You know, we want to, you know, think of ourselves as the, the, the knight on the white charger charging in to, to, to save the day. Um, and that's not what this looks like. That's not what resistance looks like. A lot of it is going to be, a lot of the work is just, it's going to be just hard work. It's going to be pragmatic. It's going to be things like driving somebody 12 hours, you know, so they can safely get an abortion. Um, it's going to be making a hundred sandwiches for, you know, the people who are meeting to figure out what their next step is. It's it's um, there's, there's a lot of the work that there is ahead is is, and again, I'm not an expect expert on resistance movements, but I, I I know that a lot of the work is just it's not heroic except in the sense that it is, except in the sense that, you know, ordinary life is heroic. So we need to think about, when we're ready, we need to think about who we want to be. Um, and I know that this is a heavy load. I'm, I know that I'm being an asshole up here. I know this is a heavy load to load on you. And I'm not asking you to do more than you can. This is really important. I, I'm asking you to think about what you can do I'm asking you to, you know, it's like normally I say, yeah, we all do what we can do. And now I'm going to say, you know, look, really look at that. Step outside your comfort zone. Look at the difference between what you can do and what you just want to do. What you can't do and what you just don't want to do. And, um, and you know what, if what you can do is survive, do that. As long as you're not hurting other people in the way that you survive. If really, if all you can do is survive, do that. Um, um, this talk was supposed to be, was originally supposed to be about practicing atheism in everyday life. And, you know, I had all these wonderful, clever ideas about that. You know, it's, it, was, it was inspirational and thoughtful. You know, wow, really made you think about and, and funny. And, um, and some of those ideas are still good. Some of those are still appropriate. Some of them are not. You know, how do we practice our atheism? How do we take the fact that we don't believe in gods, that we don't believe in an afterlife, that we don't believe in the supernatural? How do we take that into our lives? Um, right now, there's one big thing for me, and I don't know if this is the big thing for you, but it's the big thing for me. There's this one big thing. There's one major way that atheism informs how I'm gonna be in this new world and that's it, this is it. This is it, this is the world. There's not a God who's gonna make it okay. There's not a God who has a plan that this is part of and it's gonna be a shitstorm, but someday it will be okay because it's part of the plan. Um, there's not an afterlife where the people who are gonna die in this, we're gonna get to see them again. There's not an afterlife where justice is going to be done. Um, I have a friend who, she, when she had recently become an atheist, she was saying, you know, the thing that I really miss about religion, the one thing I really miss about religion is hell. And I was like, what? <laughs> I haven't heard that one before. I've heard a lot of answers to the question of what I miss about religion, including nothing. Um, I had not heard that one before. Most people who once believed in hell are like so glad to be rid of that. But what she said, she said is, it's very hard for me to bear the idea that Hitler is not in hell. It's very hard for me to bear the idea that Stalin is not in hell. The idea that people who owned slaves and tortured them and, you know, it, it's very hard for me to bear the idea that they're not in hell, that there's, that there's no justice that you can get away with it. Um, and I didn't really get what she meant, and I kind of now get what she meant. It's, it's, 
That's what we as atheists, that's what informs us as atheists. We don't have that. There's no plan. There's nobody who's going to make it right. There's no, we're not going to see the people who, we, who've died again. They're gone. And the only justice is justice that we make. The only justice is justice that we make. And there's not going to be enough of it. <laughs> um, T Terry Pratchett, I think, and I, don't, I forget the book, but Terry Pratchett wrote that, um, I forget the exact words, but the justice isn't a substance. You know, you can cut the world up into atoms and you're not going to, you know, there's not going to be an atom of justice. It's not a substance. Justice is, is the thing that we make. Um, and that's, you know, that's what we have to bring. This is it, this world, and it's going to be a hard world for, for a lot of us. Um, and this is, this is the world. Um, this world of survival, this world of taking care of each other, and this world of resistance. Um, and I really wish I had more. I, I wish I had more to give you. Um, that's it. That's what I got. This is the world. Survive, take care of each other, resist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.